Welcome everyone to the Interactive Media Capstone Presentations. You are in the Multimedia Storytelling Capstone Presentation, and I am so thrilled to be hosting this. This is the most exciting day in the Interactive Media program because we have uh, students who have been working their tails off to make these wonderful interactive multimedia storytelling presentations for you. And uh, the four students who are here are, are amazing talents, and, and I hope that uh, um, I hope that you can appreciate the, the efforts that they have put into these things. So um, my name is William Moner. I'm on faculty in the Interactive Media Program, and, uh, and I had the, uh, the opportunity to teach a game design and development class uh, with, with a couple of folks from this group. And so um, I can attest to their hard work and dedication uh, from that crew. But but I'm always impressed by this stuff. And uh, before we begin, I want to allow our students to give a brief introduction of themselves, uh, very brief, and then I'm gonna go to a, um, an introduction from program director, Derek LaCaf. Uh, he recorded a, uh, an intro via video. So, um, so we'll, start with, um, we'll start with Ben. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Ben Johnson. The project that I'm presenting today is called Ghost Notes. I can go. My name is Yasmin Grandison, and the project that I will be presenting today is called Fellowship. Okay, Chandler. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chandler Coclow, and the project that I will be presenting today is If She Can Do It. I'm Jeffrey Cullendine, and my project is Goodbye Fantarama. Fantastic. So I'm going to share my screen and play you a quick video, and we'll see you back here in. Uh, in a couple seconds. Good evening, and welcome to the 12th annual exhibition of capstone projects from the students in the Master of Arts and in Interactive Media program at Elon University. My name is Derek LeCaf, and I'm the program's faculty director. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce this very special event. Last July, these students arrived on Elon's campus, having decided to complete an intensive graduate program in the middle of a global pandemic. That alone should give you a sense of the ambition and dedication possessed by this cohort. They brought previous knowledge and skills in areas ranging from media arts to graphic design to Spanish language to dance choreography. Over the course of 10 months, they researched, designed, and produced a wide range of projects as they learned everything they could about the different domains of interactive media. This evening, the students are showcasing the most significant, ambitious, and personal projects they created in the program. These capstone projects began with intensive audience and user research, were designed to achieve specific goals, and were professionally produced and developed across multiple user-tested drafts and prototypes. As you'll see, the content of these projects is incredibly diverse and vibrant, but every capstone reflects a shared commitment to design principles and understanding of production process. I know you will enjoy these presentations, and I encourage you to engage with these projects and the students afterwards. Each of these polished projects is the endpoint of a long journey. Each student overcame different challenges and made hard decisions to bring an excellent project to fruition. And now, at the end, they're very excited to share these stories. For that introduction, and uh, without further ado, Ben Johnson is our first presenter. So Ben, go ahead and take it away. You've got 10 minutes and we'll... Uh... We're looking forward to hearing from you. Sounds good, thank you. All right, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, so um, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Ben Johnson, and I'm here to tell you about my project, Ghost Notes, uh, which is an interactive narrative with elements of music production, filmmaking, and game design. Today, I will be talking about my creative process as it pertains to four major content areas, sound design, user experience and interface design, video game development, and interactive storytelling. So the premise is relatively simple. Imagine you get a call to host a concert tour for your favorite band. Sounds great, right? You take on the task of scheduling shows and booking venues, but there's one small issue. None of the musicians have been hired to help on the tour. And that's where the story starts with Ghost Notes. You still have to keep up with all those other tasks, but now there's the added challenge, or as I would say, the option for strategy of enlisting the appropriate musicians for each role and for each show. At the beginning of production, I came up with a few gameplay challenges to incorporate into the game. Though not are all present in this version, 
I have a plan to include all four of these concepts in future iterations. The challenges are play the hits. The user is given multiple concert scenes with varying styles of music that they must successfully mix. Keep the fans. The user must select appropriate musician for the song style and venue or risk losing support of the fan base. Future, future iterations will include a time-based mechanic called stand schedule and a robust scoring system called keep it together. I'll get more in depth with those in a minute, but for now, I'd like to take you on a journey through the first few scenes of the game. You start out here in an office in New York. Here's where you get your first story scene told through a phone call. This is a recurring theme throughout the game as most story scenes are told through diegetic audio. I decided to use this as the primary narrative device to move the story along. In this scene, you were given the job and told to head out to Los Angeles. So you hop on a plane and the next scene is the first point where you can start making decisions. You're given a roster and told to pick the lineup for the next show. As you can see, there are a few options for each member of the band, which leads us to a backstage scene where you, given, where you are given a tutorial in the form of radio contact from the concert stage manager. After a quick practice round, you're thrust in the, into the performance and must correctly balance the instrument tracks in the mix while also keeping up the small challenges that appear on either side of the mixer. This is the core gameplay of Ghost Notes. And when I was developing the project, I decided to build it into a uh, open-ended platform that would allow for easy expansion in the future. Instead of scripting a brand new scene for any additional songs, the coding architecture I built requires the adjustment of just a few parameters before it is able to access, accept uh, any multi-track audio source. With this implementation, it will be easier to add expansion packs and additional songs in the future. I wanna briefly mention the digital tools um, involved in the making of this project. The game itself was built in Unity and scripted with C-sharp programming using a few, a few additional plugins and libraries. If you would like to see a full list of everything that I used, there's a credit section at the end of this presentation and also at the link that I've provided in the chat and on the Capstone website. All music was written by me and was mixed in Ableton Live. The tracks that I performed were also recorded in Ableton as well. I worked remotely with other musicians on some tracks who used other digital audio workstations such as Apple Logic and Avid Pro Tools. All UI elements and flat graphics were created in Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator. Pictured here is actually an early version of the logo constructed entirely of magazine cutouts. I also mentioned Adobe Dimension on this slide, which I will get into in a minute. One of the most important assets of the game is the mixer itself. I had a lot of requirements for what the mixer needed to do and how it had to operate. So I wasn't able to use any sort of pre-made asset for this purpose. This led to the creation of a fully customized asset constructed in Blender with my good friend and collaborator, John Valley, who I believe is in the audience here uh, today. So thank you for your help, John. And here's a close-up of that asset. Just because I, I love the way that it uh, turned out. Let me go back, here we go. Um, as you can see, it's fully textured with appropriate materials. Any 3D asset that you see in the game is actually pre-rendered. And to do that, I use Adobe, Dim Adobe Dimension, which is a streamlined 3D environment tool for rendering realistic scenes. I found that it really helped with my workflow as it is compatible with Adobe Photoshop and uh, Illustrator. Having lightweight files in the form of flat images allowed me to spend more time on the design of the game and less time optimizing assets and dealing with issues that arise when using 3D objects in a Unity project. Now I'll mention a few challenges I faced throughout this project. A big one was time management, but more specifically adapting to the schedules of others. I worked with several musicians and I know creatives can be hard to pin down sometimes. I had to adjust my schedule and plans when musicians became unavailable, but ultimately I like how the project turned out even with these changes. Another challenge was not being very familiar with the Unity engine. There are a few hiccups in development, but I've listed in the credits a number of resources that helped me better my C-sharp skills. I hosted a number of usability sessions with users from two major areas of expertise, arts administration and game design. The first group had a lot of great input into what should be included in the role of a tour manager. The second group inspired me to rewrite the tutorial scene of the game to include data chunking methods to better improve the user experience. After these sessions, I came up with three opportunities for expansion. 
One would be to increase the number of concerts. Two would be to improve the mixture functionality um, and add more functionality. And three would be to add different difficulty levels, including a simulator mode specifically craft, crafted to mimic real situations. So this would be more of an education tool than a form of entertainment. So lastly, I wanna thank my collaborators, all listed on this slide. I mentioned John um, is here today. I think uh, another few of my uh, collaborators are also here. So I wanna thank them personally. Um, I couldn't, done, I couldn't have made such a successful project without them and I appreciate their hard work. If you would like to play Ghost Notes for yourself, chapter one is now available on my portfolio website at this link. And also if you wanna scan this QR code. Thank you for your time. And I believe I have a few more minutes. So I'm gonna do a quick Q and A. Let me stop sharing. So if you have a question for me, if you wanna put it in the chat, All right, and if uh, no questions, I think we can move right along. Thank you. All right. Very good, Ben, thank you so much. Um, for those of you in attendance who uh, want to emote during the presentations, uh, you can certainly select from the reactions at the bottom of the screen if you have them available. And uh, our presenters really love to see some clapping hands. Thank you, Dr. Sturge. Uh, and Allison, thank you for your reactions. Those are those are wonderful to at least see that there's life behind the other side of the screen. So uh, thank you once again, Ben. I, um, I enjoyed seeing the the production uh, progress from the beginning of the semester to the end. It really came a long way, and uh, love to see it. And I'm so glad to hear there's more planned for it. So next up, we have Chandler. Chandler, uh, Chandler, go go ahead, and you can take it away. All right. Um, Professor Moner, can you see this okay? Can everyone else see this okay? Absolutely, it looks good. All right, sounds great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chandler Coclau, and today I will be presenting my capstone project, If She Can Do It. Just to give an overview of what type of project I created, I did an interactive storytelling that enhances reading comprehension, it empowers young Black girls to break barriers, and it also educates them on historic figures in modern day society. In the beginning phases of this process, I tried to think of the things that I had life experiences on to get some inspiration for what type of project I wanted to create for this capstone. So as you can see in the top left corner, I have a picture of myself in undergrad where I served as a mentor to middle schoolers at a local middle school. Um, this opportunity allowed me to see what it's like to have a role model for young girls and to be that impactful person in their lives, particularly young black girls. In the right corner, you see a picture with me and some other people. I was an intern at Freedom School Partners. This is a nonprofit in Charlotte, North Carolina. Their aim as a nonprofit is to encourage children within the Charlotte Mecklenburg school system to gain a passion in reading and learning during the summer months so they're prepared for the school year. And at the bottom left, there's a picture of myself when I was three years old. I was a dancer the majority of my life, but during my dance career, I was one of the only dancers of color. So when it came to creating a capstone project, I wanted to create something that I wish I had when I was around that age to see the importance of representation and to know that I could break barriers despite my background. Now I will talk a little bit about the story summary. Um, on this page, you see a picture of a character. This is my main character, Layla. My interactive storytelling follows her dreams of discovering careers based on her encounters with historic Black women. After the end of each encounter, readers have the option to navigate through different careers that Layla should explore next by clicking on animated buttons and icons. In the beginning phases of creating this project, I really wanted to hone in on what a user may need from this capstone. 
So I created a user research survey for educators and parents of young children. So right here, you can see some of the questions that I asked my 16 participants when it came to thinking of what a user may need. And from that user research, I was able to compile three main goals slash obje objectives. And I like to call these the three E's. So my focus was to engage, to educate, and to empower. I am able to engage readers through animations, voiceovers, customizable navigation. Next, I'm able to educate these readers through vocabulary cards and historical facts. And finally, I'm able to empower these readers by centering Black women as main characters and highlighting modern day stories. When I think of how Black women are represented, especially in literature, we tend to go back to the 1960s. So I really want to push modern stories so they're more relevant to the current day that we live in. And from that user research, I was able to come up with my primary and secondary audiences. So my primary audience is Black girls. These Black girls, they follow underneath two minority groups, one being Black and two being women. So from that, I really wanted to push the importance of representation because those groups know what it's like to be underrepresented in society the most. Secondary audiences include third to fifth graders. Like I said, I conducted user research with educators and they really emphasize that around that age range, they're starting to take standardized tests where they're more exposed to challenging words. So within my interactive storytelling, users will find vocabulary words that will help them enhance their reading comprehension skills and learn new words to have in their vocabulary. At the bottom, I have a parent persona, which shows what a parent will do once they have a child involved in virtual learning. To the right, I also have a child persona that highlights how a child would engage in virtual learning. Next, I did a user journey map. And from this, it explores how a child will navigate through an interactive storytelling and how that will enhance their literacy skills. And this brings me to my final deliverable. So I am going to show a brief clip of what a reader may see within this storytelling. So I am going to show that. And I want you to pay attention to some of the clickable options that readers have the chance to interact with throughout this journey. If she can do it. Written and illustrated by Chandler. As Layla laid down, fast asleep, she began to dream of what she can be. With career day running through her mind, what path will she fill most aligned? Aligned, verb, to find proper placement to, and slash or with. She walked down the steps with a sense of anticipation as a brown girl stood tall before the nation. Anticipation, noun. The act of looking forward to something. The girl wore a yellow coat as bright as the sun. Introducing Amanda Gorham. Her moment has just begun. After finishing her poem, she proudly took her seat. Amanda looked at Layla. You're the person I want to meet. I'm the youngest poet to speak at an inauguration. I am proof dreams do not have to stay in your imagination. Inauguration. Noun. A ceremony that highlights an induction into office.
I've looked up to figures like the amazing Maya Angelou. You should always find role models that spark the light within you. As the morning sun began to rise, Layla slowly opened her eyes. I can be anything, she said with glee. Can you guess what career Layla wants to be? So that concludes a brief rundown of what you might see within that story. So I wanted to reflect on this overall process of creating this capstone. First, I wanted to talk about how I was able to combine my skills with my passion. In interactive media, I found that I have a passion for creating and doing designs. And from that, I was able to combine it with my passion of uplifting young girls. So I really found it really personal to do that within this process. Next, I'm always up for a challenge. So I wanted to challenge myself with new software. So everything that you saw within that video of the interactive storytelling was created in Sarah's, which is a platform that allows navigations and things to be organized in a storytelling manner. I was able to illustrate all my characters through Procreate, which is an application on Apple's software. And next, I was able to understand the importance of conducting user research. From that, I was really honing in on what educators want their children to learn within their literacy experience. And lastly, thinking innovatively about the future of literature. As we live in a world that's constantly moving into a digital, digital world, I think it's important to think of what contributions that we as creatives can bring to the world that will keep us really happy with what we traditionally used back then when things weren't just technology driven. So this brings me to my conclusion. Um, I would love to stay connected with you all. You can reach me on LinkedIn or email as well as my portfolio at the bottom where I'm showcasing this project as well as other projects throughout this program. And yeah, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat box. All right, very good. Chandler, thank you so much. <clears throat> Uh, again, folks, if you have reactions to share with Chandler, Chandler, Amanda already clapped, um, so I'm not going to make her clap again. I, I just want to make sure that you saw that. Um, and uh, I appreciated just to uh, to share. I appreciated the the way that you carried the dream metaphor through, and I think this is really relevant stuff. I mean, uh, students um, who are in the age group that you are have been focusing on. Uh, are using all of these online tools and an online storybook like this, I think uh, could be really uh, a start to something amazing. So uh, congratulations on that. If, um, if you would Chandler, if you could post your uh, portfolio link to the chat, uh, that way um, folks who are participating can go ahead and click through a little bit later. And also if you go to capstone 21, uh, dot Elon -imedia .org. Uh, you can see all of the presentations um, and the portfolios of the students who are uh, in our group. So um, without further ado, we're going to move on to Yasmin Grandison, and she's going to present her project. All right, so take it away. Thank you. Not sure what's the presenting, but I'm just going to present like this. There we go. All right. My name is Yasmin Grandison. I'm going to present my capstone project, which is Fellowship, which is an interactive Bible story experience that teaches elementary age students and kids fundamentals of biblical teaching through the Echo platform. And this is my QR code right here. If you would like to follow this link, it'll show you my um, capstone page. Fellowship was created to be a mock-up for a Christian entertainment platform for parents and educators who are interested in increasing Christian entertainment in their child or student's life. Composed of several interactive videos, the series Noah's Court teaches children fundamental Bible lessons. Not only will children learn how to walk out their lives according to God's word, 
They will also learn how to build a stronger relationship with God by watching the short stories on fellowship. Through fellowship, I wanted children to learn more about a relationship with God rather than religion. What do you think of when you think of religion? I think of a list of rules that may be hard to follow and endless work towards goals that seem to never be achieved. Teaching a relationship with God is more personal and will help children to realize that God is not an ominous figure in the clouds, but he is a comforter, a friend, a healer, and a safe place in our time of need. One Bible verse that this platform stands on is Proverbs 22, verse 26 in the New Living Translation, which states, direct your children onto the right path, and as they get old, they will not leave it. The Bible often compares people to houses. If a house doesn't have a strong foundation, it will come crashing down when the environment gets tough. If a house has a strong foundation, it'll be much harder to tear that house down because it has a strong base. Of course, as humans, we're going to be confronted with many tests and trials, but with a, a strong foundation in God, it'll be harder for that person to fall when confronted with these tests and trials. Noah's court focuses on Noah Williams, who is a 12-year-old boy from Detroit who, seemed, who, want, who dreams excuse me, to be a famous basketball player. Noah's reality is that he has a lot to learn before he becomes his basketball player. And I wanted this first um, series to focus more on a lesser targeted demographic. And that's usually um, children who are in the inner cities. Usually children shows target kids who live in suburbs with big houses and two parent homes. This leaves out children who may not have the standard perfect household. I wanted to shed light on inner city kids who have just as big dreams as suburban kids, but who may have to go through many other hurdles in order to reach their goals. Their dreams matter too. This brings me to my two creative inspirations for my short, Hey Arnold and Hayao Miyazaki. If you're not familiar with either, Hey Arnold is an older Nickelodeon television show that aired between 1996 and 2004. Hey Arnold is the story of Arnold, who's an American fourth grader who lives in a big city with his grandparents. I enjoyed Hey Arnold when I was younger as Hey Arnold's experience of basically running the city in New York kind of resonated with me as I was in Detroit and in a big city. Hayao Miyazaki is a Japanese animator, director, and screenwriter. Miyazaki's production company, Studio Ghibli, has created films like Spirited Away and My Neighbor Totoro. I was inspired by Miyazaki's work as his cartoons are extremely detailed. Every character has its own personality that comes to life in, a way that, in the way that they walk, their accent, their facial expressions, and how they breathe. I wanted Fellowship to have many detailed elements that make the cartoon come to life and feel real to the children who are watching it. I chose the Echo platform to display my series. Through Echo, my user will be able to play the short and make a choice between a bad way to approach the situation and a better way to approach the situation. My goal is by the end of every episode, my viewer will be able to take a lesson back with them to be able to use when they are approached with a similar situation in the real world. I wanted my episodes to cover a wide range of scenarios so that my user will be prepared for any test. The process of my project included research where I conducted several surveys that asked my users about their relationship with God and their cartoon preferences, storyboarding, drawing and drawing, which brought my concept and script to life, finding voice actors during the pandemic, and then production, which involved assembling my characters, voices, and illustrated elements. I had three target audiences, which include parents, educators, and children. While creating user personas for my target audiences, I was able to decipher their motivations, interests, and frustrations of my users, which, um, let, which worked towards a better experience for my users while using the fellowship platform. I found that using the user personas is a great technique that put me in the mind of my user. So these are some sketches that I use to illustrate my characters. I just drew them out and then I would go over them with the pen tool using Illustrator. I wanted my characters to be diverse and show a range of skin tones and hair types. And I think that it's just really important that black kids see that so they see that they're um, not being typecast and that they see that there's lighter skinned women, there's darker skinned people and that they won't feel like they are into a certain mold. In the right hand corner is a breakdown of my main character. I put every limb and body part on its own layers in order to move my character easier. By the end of my choice clips, I had over 500 layers for a video that was only two to three minutes. 
Detroit, it was a big inspiration for me, for me also as I created this ep episode, as I tried to incorporate many elements from Detroit for my own memory. And as you see here, this is a the spirit of Detroit. It's a monument in Detroit. And I just copied it from this inspiration to put into my cartoon. I used Adobe Illustrator to illustrate my sketches and um, sketches and storyboards. Adobe Audition to clean up any background noise and any noise grain in the audio. I use Adobe After Effects to position my characters and the scenes surrounding them. I also use After Effects to um, move the bulk of my animation. I use Premiere Pro to synchronize my character voices and their mouth formations and add sound effects as well as add my theme music. I also use Duke Basil, um, which was used in order to make the movements more fluid and less robotic. I also use Zoom, which I use to um, record the voice actors as they were talking for my characters. Thank you so much for watching um, or for listening to my project. And this is my email. And if you follow this link, it will get you right to my capstone project page. And I think I have a few minutes for questions if anyone would like to ask me a question. All right, very good. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, I really liked the variety of characters in your project too, that there were there's a really robust story world that I think you could build into. And um, obviously the ties back to, to um, biblical stories and everything, I think are really important to this project. And so, um, you know, everything from the names to the setting to, uh, to, to the um, contents of the stories themselves uh, were very deliberately chosen. And uh, so I appreciated that very much about your, your project. You. Um, Dr. Ford is asking if you could share, um, Dean Ford uh, is asking if you could share the link in the chat uh, to your project in your presentation, please. And we are rolling through here. Um, so it's, it's 6.05, we're ahead, or it's, it's close to 6.05, we're just a couple of minutes ahead of schedule. So. Um, <clears throat> Jeffrey, I'm not sure if you have anybody who's coming in hoping to uh, to pop in and see your project, but um, if you'd like to get started, you're welcome to do that now. Uh, if you want to, um, if you want to yeah, wait, I'm, I'm ready to go. Thank okay, you, ready to go. All right. So, um, Dr. Sergil mentioned in the chat, looking for a new audience in inner city kids was smart and important, and uh, I agree. I wanted to elevate that comment. Uh, Jarrell Clark said, "Great job. Enjoy this." Um, so we will um, thank you again, Yasmin. We'll move to uh, Jeffrey Cullen Dean uh, for the final presentation of this wonderful multimedia storytelling group. Uh, one second, can you you can hear me all right, right? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Cullen Dean, and this is my project, Goodbye Fantorama. It is a work of interactive fiction. So to get started, um, like I said, interactive fiction, and it tells the story of a roadside attraction and its final days. And so we can sort of set some uh, groundwork. Interactive fiction requires user input to progress the story forward. Think of it like a video game or just sort of, a, or what mine is, which is called hypertext fiction as a subset. So here's what a page would look like. There's text on the page, and my sort of go-to example is um, if Wikipedia was a choose-your-own-adventure novel. We navigate by clicking the links that are words, and those words should bring you to other pages that are um, sort of whether inspired by that word or phrase or you know, something like that. So the project was primarily, uh, I used four technologies for the project. Word as my, uh, uh, Microsoft Word as my uh, word processor of choice, Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop or uh, image creation, like the peacock you saw in the previous slide, and then twine to connect everything together and to make the whole thing possible. Oops, there we go. And so this started with a, um, as a large research project, reading various journal articles on internet gaming disorder and more specifically escapism and people sort of uh, diving into fantasies as a way to, uh, you know, to, well, to escape. And then I also read a dissertation on hypertext fiction more of the uh, uh, technical side of this rather than the, the subtext that would inform the narrative. And then as well as other interactive fiction like Blue Hyacinth, Luminous Airplanes and The Unknown, which are some prominent, prominent uh, hypertext works.
that were more in the vein of what I was doing compared to others that are um, very contemporary. Uh, for instance, The Unknown and Blue Hyacinth are um, mostly from the late 90s and early 2000s. And work like this that's being done now, it's much more gamey, um, much more text adventure. And I, I really wanted something that's a bit more uh, literary focused. Now, all of this is important because I created two personas for this project. Uh, one, the red one, is a new reader. Someone who's never played this before has more of an influence of video games. And the blue one, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the blue one is a more experienced reader. And they were reading things like The Unknown in the late 90s and early 2000s, things like that, and Blue Hyacinth. And so I wanted to make something that would appeal to both, that had uh, the game elements that are common in contemporary work, but still had the much more literature focus of, uh, um, of the older work. And so this is what the first draft of the project looked like. Um, everything was entirely out of order, and there were two competing narratives through the whole thing, one written in first person and one written in third person. They sometimes inter intersected, but they took place in the same area. Now they're connected by words and phrases and mostly by feeling uh, to navigate pages. And so I brought this in front of readers and uh, for a usability test. And the, the results were not good. Uh, most found the nar narrative confusing and um, they were frustrated because it's easy to get caught in a two or three page loop, which is the same two to three pages over and over and over again. Um, some thought that the competing narratives were actually the same person when they were actually separate people. Um, and more of them wanted to treat the narrative like a game rather than writing. Um, people were just furiously flick through trying to read every single page. Um, and now the, uh, the, some of the parameters of this test though, I did say um, because the whole thing loops, there is no strict ending. I told them uh, the test was over when they felt like they were done. So this would inspire a, a bit of a completionist attitude for these users. Um, like I said, furiously going through pages. Um, sometimes if they would get to, at the time, I believe there were about 26 pages. If they had 20, they would just click, 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 trying to find those last six pages. Uh, it was, like I said, it was more of a game or a detective uh, work for them. And even when they, listening to the um, words that they used, it was like trying to figure it out. It was much more puzzle-like language than just sort of experiential storytelling, like, uh, like just reading a regular book. So this is what the second draft looked like. I took the two stories and I kept them bound together. All of the first person parts were held, you know, connected to first person pages, all of the third person pages connected to each other. And then just to see if I can make it work, I added a third branch. So this is the branching draft. The three stories are separate and they still had that scramble nature in them that made it work. Um, uh, a piece of hypertext I mentioned earlier, the unknown works like this. It's entirely out of order and bound by words. And that was something I wanted to keep in order to uh, appeal to the, you know, the older demographic that would have read the, the re older work of this. And the, uh, the feedback was much more positive. Uh, most preferred the branching draft. Um, the narrative was much more cohesive and people liked the variety of the stories. However, there were mixed opinions on the ending because the project still didn't have an ending. And now I should note that uh, the second test had two groups. There was group A and group B. Group A consisted of everyone from the first test and group B was from new readers. Um, the people in group A, uh, however, liked the lack of an ending. Whereas the people in group B were much more passionate about needing an ending. And I think this was sort of, this was sort of my way of bringing those two personas um, into existence. I managed to create my um, older, older experienced readers and I had my much newer readers. So the newer readers wanted an ending the what we'll call the experienced ones were fine to not have one. And so somehow I needed to um, solve this problem. The project still didn't have an ending. And, um, but while tracking the, uh, these tests, I noticed most people in the newer reader group didn't read every page. They actually visited most and some and actually even missed an entire branch. Uh, out of that group, there were five of them. Four of them did not read every page, only one did. So. To do that, to take all these uh, opinions in, and with that data in mind, oops, I created what I call the flower draft based on its shape. So people like the variety of stories, so I split one of the branches into two, and then I also wrote a new branch that's up there. And now in order to get to the end, which uh, it's locked, you actually can't get it unless you visit every single page. And so this is my idea to um, satisfy both groups, the people who aren't having this completionist attitude, who aren't visiting everything, still have the illusion that the project never ends, that it's just one giant loop, 
And the people who do get everything get rewarded with sort of this uh, secret fifth branch within the story. And so how does this work? It looks a bit like this on inside of Twine, which is holding the whole thing together. Uh, there are trackers on some of the links, um, making sure that these pages are visited. You can see that in the pink and green text. So once, you know, uh, Charlie on the ride, Charlie intro, Charlie's favorite are all visited along with the others. It'll deactivate that link on a special hub page that leads to the branches. And then it'll activate the fifth link that leads to the branch if all are seen. Now there are visuals in the project. And so it, and it does follow a bit of a style guide. Pages that lack images take place after the destruction of the ride. Uh, it's just text on a black background, much like this page. Pages that take place off the ride have images with vector graphics, because while um, that is sort of the real world in this, uh, I wanted it to feel a bit fake. And then pages that take place on the ride, which gives dissociative visions to its writers, use photography, because uh, uh, part of the story is how it feels much more real to these people than, um, than the real world does. So, for example, here's a page in the real world with the vector graphics with the bird. Here's a page that takes place on the ride, um, who always have this silhouette and uh, uses real world photography. And then here are some sketches that started. Um, uh, everything started on paper like this, but just hammering out ideas on what images would accompany. And usually it's something that was either um, evocative of an idea in the prose or um, took something that was mentioned in the writing. So this page, for instance, mentions a balloon. And then uh, I sort of played around with where I thought the text would go. And then the image on the right is um, that repeating silhouette that appears in every branch and sort of figuring out how that would work. And now, so here's an example of how the image has changed. Um, I used uh, public domain images and images with cre uh, liberal Creative Commons licenses. So I took the one on the left with a single balloon and edited it in uh, Illustrator and Photoshop to more, be more of a bouquet. Similar to this one, I took a NASA photo of an astronaut and then included fish, which was an image within the writing uh, inside. I got rid of the, uh, all the, you know, the, the spacecraft behind him and uh, included the necessary pieces that I need. Likewise, this TV. Um, I mentioned there's a commercial that mentions space, a very big recurring theme in this. Um, and so I put a, another picture uh, from, a, from a telescope inside the TV and then deleted anything that I didn't need it around it. And then Twine's default will just place the text over the middle of the screen. And so I needed to use uh, CSS manipulation to move it out of the way so it's readable. Otherwise, you know, the images will just kind of make it messy and hard to read. So. I use positions and width to turn uh, the text into smaller boxes and move it to the side. And this is my contact information if you would like to reach out. This is a link to my portfolio and the bottom one is a link to the project if you would like to read it. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I believe there's a little bit of time now to ask them. This is indeed the case, Jeffrey. Thank you so much for this. Um, you're, you're welcome to ask questions and I'm gonna repost the, uh, the Capstone 21 um, website link for those of you to uh, see the rest of the projects and to get contact information and everything. So Amanda Sturgill comments is one of those old people you mentioned at the beginning. Um, I've seen interactive fiction from the beginning. The systematic approach to creating it is really interesting. And um, I, I agree, I, I echo that. It was really interesting to see uh, the different branching narrative styles and choices that you made and that you're acting on the user feedback and really trying to deliver a story that um, that, that seemed to make sense. And so I wanted to kind of open up a question to the group and, and you all can, can answer this um, either one by one or um, at your leisure, but Jeffrey, you have the uh, prerogative since your uh, presentation was most recent. Um, what did you see as the benefits and challenges to responding to so much user feedback? Because I know each of you were testing this two or three times throughout the semester. So what was what was it about your responses to that stuff that um, that provided benefit and what was challenging about it? Uh, I can go first. Uh, for me, like I said, um, it did, my project didn't have an ending for a long time. And so using that feedback really helped me figure out how I wanted to end it. You know, it was always just a loop for the longest time. 
and uh, you know, when people weren't satisfied with the ending or were satisfied with it, um, it really pointed me in the right direction on where to go, as well as just figuring out what did and did not work. Very good. For me, um, when I sent out a, a survey asking what was the best part about a TV show when you were kid, when you were a kid, and a lot of people came up and said like, oh, well, the characters are oh, like the stories. Like, it's really just like merging those two, just to get you know. I think that's two elements that people really like to see when they watch a cartoon. So that was for me. I think the uh, the usability tests that I conducted really helped me um, iron out the the introduction scene, the sort of tutorial um, that I have for my game. Um, I tried a version where it was just all of the um, information was kind of front loaded. And then the, um, the user would try to have to, would kind of have to work out um, all those instructions when actually in the game. Uh, I found out that didn't work too well. So the way that it exists now is that it's kind of split up into sections and you get to try it out before you actually go into the game itself. So I think those usability tests were very helpful in that regard. Um, for me, the usability test was really helpful in determining what words were most efficient for the age group that I was looking for to be the target reader. So going back to those educators and seeing what they really wanted to push for their children to learn when it comes to vocabulary, that really helped me. Did you put it in front of any kids? Yes, I did. So I had some teachers who teach for Teach for America and they showcased it to some of their children um, within their class and they were able to get feedback based on that. That's amazing. Well, I can't speak for the entirety of the IA Media program, but <clears throat> but I'll I'll take a I'll take a stab at it. Um, we're all very proud of you for uh, making it through this semester, all of the trials and tribulations and how hard it was to uh, pull off some of these things, as Yasmin mentioned in her presentation with um, voice talent that you're working with remotely rather than in the room or in the studio, and really trying to um, to learn the technologies while you're trying to produce a story, while you're writing something original, while you're you know conceptualizing and user testing, and you're doing all of these amazing things all at the same time, um, down to, you know, even there's a question in the chat from TC uh, asking Jeffrey, was Fantarama.com available or do you already have that domain? Uh, can you answer that real quick? Uh, I had to buy it. Yeah. It was available. And it's funny how, how many domains are available. So, um, so, but making those choices, like finding out if it's, uh, if it's available as a domain versus not, um, trying to claim your name on the internet as a domain name is always a, an adventure. You know, all of those little things that do take a lot of time and energy um, also were done by these students. So, um, so as I said, I, I applaud you for the effort that you've put in. You have shown um, great progress uh, since July when you first hit here in uh, boot camp and um, and then moved into your fall classes and and uh, so. I uh, appreciate the work that you put in and uh, <laughs> yeah, um, y'all have done it. So um, so I, I think at this point, um, I mean, we have the privilege of having having Derek in the uh, in the room here. And if if Derek is is available, um, I don't want to put him on the spot or anything. But um, Dr. Lacaf, if you have any um, any words to share, we can get a can have those now. Um, and, you know, for those of you who attended, again, uh, capstone21.elonimedia.org uh, is the uh, is the, the site where the rest of the presentations are located. Uh, and so I would, uh, I would encourage you to check out the, the site and, and take a look. So y'all, you did it. Congratulations. Um, and uh, Ben, uh, you were uh, the host of this. Any final, final thoughts as the the group leader here. Um, thank you for coming, everyone. Um, I think we have a little bit of time. Um, if people want to stick around, um, we have some unstructured time. If you want to meet with anyone in particular, if you have any more questions, um, if you want to put them in the chat, um, I think we'll stick around for maybe five more minutes. And if there's no one else that has questions, we'll, uh, we'll kind of wrap up. But uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. We really appreciate it.
All right, cool. I think maybe uh, I think maybe we're good then. <laughs> Doesn't seem like there's any more questions. Well, I, I'm seeing a lot of chat action. So, um, you know, Sierra said, congratulations, very impressive. And TC said, great work uh, to all great projects from John Valley. Thank you for uh, for your contribution to Ben's work too. Oh, yes. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, great stuff. All right. Um, thanks, everyone. Enjoy your evening. We'll see you tomorrow night at graduation. It'll be amazing. Take care. Yeah.